An Old Tale Retold by Madison Cowain, read for LibriVox.org by Sandra. From the terrace here where the hills indent, you can see the uttermost battlement of the castle there, the Clifford's home where the seasons go and the seasons come, and never a footstep else doth fall save the prowling foxes. The ancient hall echoes no voice save the owlet's call. Its turret chambers are homes for the bat, and its courts are tangled and wild to see, and where in the cellar was once the rat, the viper and toad move stealthily. Long years have passed since the place was burned, and he sailed to the wars in France and earned the name that he bears of the bold and true on his tomb. Long years since my lord, Sir Hugh, lived, and I was his favourite page. And the thing then happened, and he, of an age when a man will love and be loved again, or off to the wars, or a monastery, or toil till he deaden his heart's hard pain, or drink, and forget it, and finally bury. I was his page, and often we fared through the Clare domain in autumn hawking, if the baron had known how they would have glared neath their bushy brows, those eyes of mocking, that last of the strong bows, Richard, I mean, and growling some six of his henchmen lean to mount, and after this Clifford, and hang with his crop-eared page to the nearest oak. How he would have cursed us while he spoke, for Clare and Clifford had ever a fang in the other's side, and I hear the clang of his rage in the hall when the hawker told, if he told, how we met on the autumn wold, his daughter, sweet Clara of Clare, the day her hooded tiercel its brails did burst, and trailing its dresses came flying our way. An untrained haggard the falconer cursed while he tried to secure, as the I.S. flew slant low and heavily over us. Hugh, who saw it coming, and had just then cast his peregrine hawk at a heron quarry, in his saddle rising thus as it passed by the Jessie's cot, and to her did carry where she stood near the wood. Her face flushed rose with the glad of the meeting. No two foes her eyes and my lord's, I swear, who saw it was love from the start and I heard him speak. Dismount, then kneel, and the sombre shaw with the sad of the autumn waste and bleak grew spring with her smile as the hawk she took on her slender wrist where it pruned and shook its callowness. Then I saw him seize the hand that she reached to him, long and white, as she smilingly bade him rise from his knees. When he kissed her fingers, her eyes grew bright, but her cheeks were pallid when lashing through the thicket there his face aflare with the sting of the wind, and his gypsy hair flying, the falconer came, and two or three of the people of Castle Clare, and the leaves of the autumn made a frame for the picture there in the morning's flame. What was said in that moment I do not know, that moment of meeting between those lovers, whatever it was, twas whispered low, soft as a leaf that swings and hovers, a twinkling gold when the woods are yellow, and her face with the joy was still aglow when out of the wood that burly fellow came with his frown and made a pause in the pulse of their words. My lord, Sir Hugh, stood with the soil on his knee. No cause had he, but his hanger he partly drew, then clapped it sharp in its sheath again, and bowed to my lady and strode away, and vaulting his horse with a loosened rein, rode with a song in his heart all day. He loved and was loved, I knew, for look, all other sports for the chase he forsook, and strange that he never went to hawk or hunt, but Clara would meet him there in the strongbow forest. I know the rock with its ferns and its moss by the bramble there, where oft and oft he met by chance, shall I say, the daughter of Clare, as fair a face as a queen in an old romance, who waits expectant and pale, her hair night deep, and eyes dove grey with dreams. By the fountain side where the statue gleams and the moonbeam lolls in the lily white for her knightly lover who comes at night. Hey ho, they ceased, those meetings, I wot, betrayed to the baron by some of his crew of menials who followed and saw and knew, for she loved too well to have once forgot the time and place of their trysting true. Why and when? would ask Sir Hugh in the laboured letters he used to lock the lover's post in a coin of that rock. She used to answer, but now did not. But, nearing Yule, 
Love gat them again a twilight tryst, through forwardness, sure, they met, and the day was grey with rain and snow, and the wind did ever endure a long bleak moaning through the wood, that chapped in the cheek and smarted the blood, and a burn in the forest went throb and throb, and over it all was the wild beast sob of the rushing boughs, like a thing pursued. And then it was that he learned how she, God's blood, how it makes my old limbs quiver to think what a miserable tyrant he, the Baron Richard, I and ever to his daughter was. Forsooth, must wed with an eastern earl, a lovel, to whom would God of his mercy had struck him dead. Clara of Clare, when merely a child, with a face like a flower that blows in the wild of the hills, and a soul like its soft perfume, was given say sealed, to strengthen some ties of power and wealth. Say bartered then, like the veriest chattel. With tearful eyes and lips a-tremble she spoke, and when my lord, her lover, had learned and heard, he'd have had her flee with him then, death, in spite of them all. Let her say the word, they would fly together. The baron's men might follow, and if, and he touched his sword, it should answer. But she, while she seemed to stay with a hand on her bosom, her heart's quick breath, replied to his heat, They would take and slay thee, who art life of my life. Not thus will we fly. There's another way for us, a way that is sure, and only way. I've thought on it this many a day. The words that she spake, how well I remember, as well as the mood of that day of December, that bullied and blustered and seemed in league like a spiteful shrew, with the wind and the snow to drown the words of their sweet intrigue, with the boom of the boughs tossed to and fro that the storm swept through with its wild beast low. Her last words, these, by curfew, sure, on Christmas Eve at the postern door. And we were there, with a led horse, too, armed for a journey. I hardly knew whither, but why, you well may guess. For often he whispered a certain name, the talisman dear of his happiness, that warmed his blood like a yule log's flame. While we waited there, till its owner came, we saw how the castle's baronial girth, like a giant's, loosed for revelling more, shone, and we heard the wassail and mirth where the mistletoe hung in the hearth's red roar, and the holly brightened the weaponed hall of carven oak in the banqueting hall and the spits, I trow, by the scullions turned o'er the snoring logs, rich steamed and burned, where the whole wild boar and the deer were roasted, and the half of an ox and the roebuck's haunches, while tons of ale that the cellars boasted and casks of sack were broached for paunches of vassals who reveled in stable and hall. The song of the minstrel, the yeoman's quarrel, or the dice and the drink, and the huntsman's ball in the baying kennels, its hounds a snarl, or the bones of the feast, now loud, now low, we could hear where we crouched in the drifting snow. Was she long? Did she come? By the postern we like shadows waited, my lord, Sir Hugh spoke, pointing a tower, that casement, see, when a stealthy light in its slit burns blue and signals thrice slowly, thus tis she. And close to his breast his gabardine drew, for the wind it whipped and the snow beat through. Did she come? We had waited an hour or twain when the taper flashed in the central pane, and flourished three times and vanished so, and under the arch of the postern's portal, crouched down by the horses we stood in the snow, stiff with the cold. Ah, me! Immortal minutes we waited, breath baited, and listened, shivering there in the hurl of the gale. The parapets whistled. The angles glistened, and the night around seemed one black wail of death, whose ominous presence over the snow-swept battlements seemed to hover. Said my lord Sir Hugh to himself, he spoke, She feels for the spring in the sliding panel neath the arras, hidden in the carven oak. It opens, the stair like a well's dark channel yawns, and the draught makes her taper slope. Wrapped deep in her mantle of fur, she puts one foot on the stair. Now a listening pause is nearer, and nearer the mad search draws of the thwarted castle. No smallest hope that they find her now that the panel shuts. If the wind that howls like a tortured thing would throttle itself with its cries, then I might hear how her hurrying footsteps ring down the secret. There, tis her fingers. Try the postern's bolts that the rust makes cling. 
but twas only some whim of the wind that shook a clanging ring on a creaking hook in the buttress or wall, and we waited, numb with the cold till dawn, but she did not come. I must tell you why, and have done. Tis said, on the eve of the marriage, she fled the side of the guests and the bridegroom there. She fled with a mischievous laugh. I'll hide, I'll hide, a kiss for the one who shall find, and led a long search after her but defied all search for a score and ten long years. Well, the laughter of Yule was turned to tears for them as for us. We saw the glare of torches that hurried from chamber to stair, and we heard the castle re-echo her name, but she laughed no answer and never came, and that was the last of Clara of Clare. That winter it was, a month thereafter, that the home of the Cliffords, roof and rafter, burned. I could swear it was the Strongbow's doing, were I sure that he knew of the Clifford's wooing, his daughter, and so, by the rood and cross, made a torch of Hugh's home to avenge his loss. So, over the channel to France, with his king, the Black Prince, sailed to the wars, to deaden the ache of the mystery, Hugh, that spring, and fell at Poitiers, for his loss lay leaden of his heart, and his life was a weary sadness. So he flung it away in a moment's madness, and the baron died, and the bridegroom, well, unlucky was he, in truth, to tell of him there's nothing. The baron died, the last of the strong bows, he, Gramercy. And the Clare estate, with its wealth and pride, devolved to the Bloods, Walter and Percy. And years went by, and it happened, that they ransacked the old castle, and so, one day in a lonesome tower, up rummaged a chest from Flanders, of ebon, and wildly carved all over with masks, a sinister crest, mid gargoyle faces distorted and starved, fast fixed with the spring which they forced, and lo, when they opened it, death, like a lady dressed, grinned up at their terror. But no, not so. Fantastic, a skeleton jewelled, and wreathed with flowers of dust, and a miniver around it clasped, that the ruin sheathed of a once rich raiment of silk and of fur. I'd have given my life to hear him tell the courtly Clifford how this befell. He'd have known how it was, for you see, in groping for the secret spring of that panel, hoping and fearing as nearer and nearer drew the search of retainers, why, out she blew the tell-tale taper, and seeing this chest would hide her a minute in it, mayhap, till the hurry had passed. But the death-lock, pressed by the lid's great weight, shut down with a snap, and her life went out in the hellish trap. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. My Lady of Verne by Madison Cowain, read for LibriVox.org, by Sandra. It all comes back as the end draws near, all comes back like a tale of old. Shall I tell you what? Will you lend an ear? You with your face so stern and cold, you who found me dying here? Lady Valora's villa at Verne. You have walked its terraces where the fountain statue gleam and the fluted urn, its world-old elms that are avenues gaunt of shadow and flame when the west is a burn. Tis a lonely region of tarns and trees and hollow hills that circle the west, haunted of rooks and the far-off seas, immemorial, vague unrest. A land of sorrowful memories, a grey sad land, where the wind has its will and the sun its way with the fruits and flowers, wherever the one all night is shrill, and ever the other all day brings hours of glimmering hush that dead dreams fill. A grey sad land, where her girlhood grew to womanhood proud, that the hill winds seem to give their moods like melody to, and the stars their thoughts like dreams love dreamed the only glad thing that the sad land knew. My lady, you know, how nobly born, greatly born, with a head that rose like a dream of empire, love and scorn made haunts of her eyes, and her lips twin bows of bloom, where wit was a pleasant thorn. And I, oh, I was nobody, one her worshipper merely, who chose to be silent, seeing that love alone was his only badge of nobility, set in his heart's escutcheon. 
How long ago does the springtime look when we wandered away to the hills, the hills like the land in the fairy tale in the book, gold with the gold of the daffodils and gemmed with the crocus by bank and brook. When I gathered a branch from a hawthorn tree for her hair or bosom, from boughs that hung odorous of heaven and purity, she thanked me, smiling, then merrily sung this song while she laughingly looked at me. There dwelt a princess over the sea, O oh, fair was she, right fair was she, Who loved a squire of low degree, of low degree, But wedded a king of Brittany, O oh, woe is me, is me. And it came to pass on the wedding day, So people say, I have heard say, That they found her dead in her bridal array, Her bridal array. And dead her lover beside her lay. Oh, well, away, away, oh, well, away, away. A sour stay for your sweets, she said, pressing the blossoms against her lips. Then, petal by petal, the branch she shred, snowing the blooms from her fingertips, tossing them down for her feet to tread. What to her was the look I gave of love despised, though she seemed to start seeing and said with a quick hand wave, Why, one would think that that was your heart, while her face with a sudden thought grew grave. But I answered nothing, and so to her home we came in the eve, slow falling, clear with a few first stars and a crescent of foam. The twilight dusked, and we heard from the mere the distant boom of a bittern come. Would you think that she loved me? Who could say? What a riddle unread was she to me? When I kissed her fingers and turned away, I wanted to speak. But what cared she, though her eyes looked soft and she bade me stay? Though she lingered to watch me, that might be a slim moonbeam or a shred of haze, but never my lady's drapery or wistful face in the woodbine maze. Valora, Vern, why, what cared she? So the days went by, and the summer wore its hot heart out, and a mighty slayer, the autumn harried the land and shore, and the world grew red with its wrecks, then greyer than ghosts of the dreams of the nevermore. The sheaves of the summer had long been bound, the harvests of autumn had long been past, and the snows of the winter lay deep around, when the hard news came and I knew at last, and the reigning woe of my heart was crowned. So I sought her here, the old earl's bride, in the ancient room at the oriel, dreaming, pale as the blooms in her hair, and wide the dented satin, flung stormily, gleaming like beaten silver, twilight died. I marked as I stole to her side that tears were vaguely large in her beautiful eyes, that the loops of pearls on her throat and years old lace on her bosom were heaved with sighs. And I said to her softly, It appears. Then stopped with, It seemed my soul in my eyes, That you're not happy, Valora of Vern. There is that at your heart which, Well, denies these mocking mummeries. Live and learn, And is it the truth or only lies? You must hear me now, Whom I oft with my heart in words of the soul That are silent in speech, Whispered my love, too sacred for art, but yours never heard, for I could not reach yours in that world of which you are part. That world where I saw you as one afar sees palms and waters, and knows that sands, pitiless sands, before him are, yet follows ever with reaching hands till he sinks at last. You were my star, my hope, my heaven, I loved you. Life is less than nothing to me. She turned with a wild look, saying, now I am his wife, you come and tell me. Indeed, you are learned in the unheard language of hearts. A knife, as she ceased and leaned on a cabinet, a curve of scintillant steel, keen, cold, fell icily clashing, a curio met among Asian antiques, bronze and gold, mystical, curiously graven and set. A Bactrian dagger, whose slightest prick through its ancient poison was death, I knew. If true that she loved me, then, and quick to the unspoken thought, she replied, "'Tis true. 
I have loved you long, and my soul was sick, sick for the love that has made me weak, weak to your will even now. And more, she said, in my arms, that I will not speak, and the dagger there on the polished floor, ever her eyes, while she spoke, would seek. And it came to pass on the wedding day. Then my lips for a moment were crushed to hers, that they found her dead in her bridal array, she sang, then said, You finish the verse, finish the song, for you know the way. And I whispered yes, for my heart had thought her own thought through, that life were a hell to us so asunder, and the blade I caught with a sudden hand, and she leaned, and well, what a little wound, and the blood it brought to crimson her bosom. I sat her there in that carven chair, then turned the blade, with its white gold handle thick with the glare, barbaric of jewels, wildly inlaid, to my breast, for the poisonous point rent bare. A stain of blood on her breast, and one black red o'er my heart. You see, tis good to die with her here. Does the sinking sun through the dull deep west burst, banked with blood? Or is it that life will at last have done? So you are her husband, and, well, you see, you see she's dead, and her face, how white, fate bungled the cards. Did this have to be? What matters it now? For at last the night falls, and the darkness covers me. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Geraldine by Madison Cowain, read for LibriVox.org, by Sandra. Ah, Geraldine, my Geraldine, that night of love when last we met you have forgotten, Geraldine. I never dreamed you would forget. Ah, Geraldine, my Geraldine, more lovely than that Asian queen Scheherazade, the beautiful, who in her Orient palace cool of India for a thousand nights and one beside her monarch lay, telling while scandal-scented lights and music stole the soul away, love-tales of old Arabia, full of enchantments and emprise, but no enchantments like your eyes. Ah, Geraldine, loved Geraldine, less lovely were those maids, I ween, Pampinea and Loretta, who in gardens old of dusk and dew sat with their lovers, maid and man, in stately days Italian and in quaint stories that we know through grace of good boccaccio told of fond loves some false some true but geraldine none as false as you ah geraldine lost geraldine that night of love when last we met you've forgotten geraldine i never dreamed you would forget twas summer and the moon swam high a great pale pearl within the sky and down that purple night of love the stars, concurrent spark on spark, seemed moths of flame that swarmed above. And through the roses o'er the park, star-like, the fireflies sowed the dark, a mockingbird in some deep tree, drowsy with dreams and melody, like a magnolia bud that dim opens and pours its soul in musk, gave to the moonlight and the dusk its heart's pure song, its evening hymn, O oh, night of love, when in the dance your heart thrilled rapture into mine, as in a state of necromance a mortal hears a voice divine. O oh, night of love, when from your glance I drank sweet death as men drink wine. You wearied of the waltz at last, I led you out into the night, warm in my hand I held yours fast. Your face was flushed, your eyes were bright, the moon hung like a shell of light above the lake. The tangled trees, and borne to us with fragrances of roses that were ripe to fall, the soul of music from the hall beat in the moonlight and the breeze, as youth's wild heart grown weary of desire and its dream of love. I held your arm, and for a while we walked along the balmy aisle of blossoms that, like velvet, dips unto the lake which lilies tile with stars, and hyacinths with strips of heaven and beside a fall that down a fern and mossy wall fell in a lake deep woodbine wound a latticed summer-house we found a green kiosk through which the sound of waters and of zephyrs swayed 
and honeysuckle bugles played soft serenades of perfume sweet around which ran a rustic seat and seated in that haunted nook i know not how it was a word a touch perhaps a sigh a look was father to the kiss i took great things grow out of the small i've heard and then it was i took between my hands your face beloved geraldine and gazed into your eyes and told the story ever new though old you did not look away but met my eyes with eyes whose lids were wet with tears of truth and you did lean your cheek to mine my geraldine i never dreamed you would forget the night wind and the water sighed and through the leaves that stirred above the moonbeams swooned with music of the dance soft things in league with love i never dreamed that you had lied how all comes back now geraldine the melody the glimmering scene your angel face and even between your lawny breasts the heart-shaped jewel to which your breath gave fluctuant fuel a rosy star of stormy fire the snowy drift of your attire lay steep and fragrant and your hair disordered in the dance held back by one gemmed pin a moonbeam there half drowned within its night-like black and i who sat beside you then seemed blessed above all mortal men i loved you for the way you sighed the way you said i love but you the smile with which your lips replied your lips that from my bosom drew the soul your looks like undenied caresses that seemed not but true i loved you for the violet scent that clung about you as a flower your moods where grief and gladness blent an april tide of sun and shower you were my creed my testament wherein i met with god's high power was it because the loving see only what they desire shall be there in the well-beloved soul passion and heart's affinity that i beheld in you the whole of my love's image and believed you loved as i loved nor perceived yours was a mask a mockery ah geraldine lost geraldine that night of love when last we met you forgotten geraldine i never dreamed you would forget end of poem this recording is in the public domain At the Corregidors by Madison Cowain, read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. At the Corregidors, the young advocate Don Sebastian Lopez, between three pinches of snuff, placed the facts of the case before his friend Don Emmanuel de Cordova, chief magistrate of the city of Valladolid. To Don Odora said Donna Devine, "I yield to thy long endeavour. At my balcony, be on the stroke of nine and senor i'm thine for ever this beauty at first had the don descried as she quit the confessional followed what a face what a form what a foot he sighed and more that he smiling swallowed and with vows as soft as his oath were sweet her heart he barricaded and pressed this point with a present meet and that point serenaded what else could the enemy do but yield to such handsome importuning a gallant blade with a lute for shield all night at her lattice mooning que es estrella thou star of all girls here's that for thy fierce duenna a purse of pistoles and a rosary of pearls and gold as yellow as henna she will drop from thy balcony's rail my sweet my seraph this silken ladder and then sweet then my soul at thy feet what angel in heaven gladder and the end of it was but i will not say how he won to the room of the lady ah to love is to live and with youth why hey for the rest a maravedi now comes her betrothed from the wars and he a count of the court castilian a don diabolus sword at knee and face and hair vermilion and his is a jealous love and for the story grows sadder and sadder he watches and sees a robber to her or gallant ascend a ladder 
so he pushes inquiry into her room with his naked sword demanding an alguazil with a face like doom sure of a stout withstanding and weapon to weapon they foined and fought the count's first thrusts were vicious three thrusts to the floor odora had brought and one through the white capricious the naked bosom of donna devine and this is the count's condition was he right was he wrong the question is mine to judge for the inquisition end of poem this recording is in the public domain an episode read for LibriVox.org by alan lawley an episode a woman speaks year 1218 war of the albigenses saint dominic pope innocent the holy host lions once bent on Lantoc may god the father plunge you in everlasting hell and may the blood of those who fell abesias together gather in torrents of eternal pain and on your souls beat boiling rain and mount fort it was given me for i had prayed incessantly to be the david of this giant an Albigensian warrior. My husband was, he, in the war, the Pope had thundered on defiant. Thielaus and outlawed Londoc stood with Earl Raymond like a rock. The wars of Bezias cried aloud, and Carcassons red in their cloud of blood, disease, and conflagration for vengeance when he left me here with my two babes i felt no fear the crusade's excommunication poured down its holy catholics to crush and burn us heretics at carcassonne he fell and there my babes died famished and despair and hell were mine within their prison to mother of our god portrayed this mountford's death on me were laid blessed hands of power in a vision a call my soul could not refuse compelled me to besiege the laus no arrow mine no arbalist, a sling, a stone, a woman's wrist. God and his virgin mother aided, their engines rocked our walls, I felt. The time had come, and, praying knelt, then from the sling, my hair had braided, launched at de Montfort's bassinet, the rock where I brow eyebrow met thus mountford died of carcassonne our lady twas who aimed the stone that slew this monster that was master for i i was the instrument saint dominic an innocent that hurled on you and yours disaster two armies saw me were the sling while heaven stood by me, white of wing. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Slave by Madison Cowan Read for LibriVox by Aaron Kay The Slave He waited till within her tower her taper signalled him the hour. He was a prince, both fair and brave. What hope that he would love her slave? He of the Persian dynasty, and she a queen of Araby. No parry singing to a star, 
upon the sea were lovelier i helped her drop the silken rope he clumb aflame with love and hope i drew the dagger from my gown and cut the ladder leaning down oh wild his face and wild the fall her face was wilder than them all i heard her cry i heard him groan and stood as merciless as a stone the eunuchs came fierce scimitars stirred in the torch-lit corridors she spoke like one who prays in sleep and bade me strike or she would leap i bade her leap the time was short and kept the dagger from my heart she leapt i put their blades aside and smiling in their faces died end of poem this recording is in the public domain The Rosicrucian by Madison Cowine, read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. The tripod flared with a purple spark, and the mist hung emerald in the dark. Now he stooped to the lilac flame over the glare of the amber embers, thrice to utter no earthly name, thrice like a mind that half remembers, bathing his face in the magic mist where the brilliance burned like an amethyst sylph whose soul was born of mine born of the love that made me thine once more flash on the flesh again be the loved caresses taken lip to lip let our mouths remain here in the circle of sense awaken ere spirit meet spirit the flesh laid by let me know thee and let me die sunset heavens may burn but never know such splendor there bloomed an ever opaline orb where the silphid rose a shape of luminous white diviner white than the essence of light that sows the moons and suns through space and finer than radiance born of a shooting star or the wild aurora that streams afar look on the face of the soul to whom thou givest thy soul like added perfume thou who heardst me who long had prayed waiting alone at evening's portal thus on thy lips let my lips be laid love who hast made me all immortal give me thine arms now come and rest happiness out on my beaming breast was it her soul or the sapphire fire that sang like the note of a seraph's lyre out of her mouth there came no word she spake with her soul as a flower speaketh fragrant messages none hath heard which the sense divines when the spirit seeketh and he seemed alone in a place so dim that the spirit's face who was gazing at him for its burning eyes he could not see then he knew he had died that she and he were one and he saw that this was she in the poem this recording is in the public domain The Norman Knight by Madison Cobbine, read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. Within the castle chamber, the Norman Knight lay dead. The quarterings of the casement shone wholly round his head. And first there came a maiden; her face was wet and white. She kissed his mouth and murmured, "Thou wast my own true knight." Within the arras chamber, the Norman Knight lay dead and tapers four and twenty burnt at his feet and head and next there came a friar and prayed beside the bier thou art a blessed angel who was so noble here within the lofty chamber the norman knight lay dead dim through the carven casement the moonbeams lit his head and then there came a varlet loud laughed he in his face thus do i spit upon thee thee and thy cursed race within the silent chamber the norman knight lay dead nor norman knight nor saxon serf heard aught the dead man said end of poem this recording is in the public domain the caliph and the arab by madison Cowine. 
read for LibriVox.org. Among the tales wherein it hath been told, in golden letters in a book of gold, of Hadim Tai's hospitality, who substanceless and dead and shadowy made men his guests upon a mountain top, whereon his tomb grayed from a thistle crop. A tomb of rock where women hewn of stone, rude figures spread dishevelled hair, whose moan from dark to daybreak made the silent sigh, at which the camel drivers tented nigh, golds or hyenas shuddering would say, but only granite women find at day. Among such tales, who questions of their truth? One tale still haunts me from my earliest youth. Of that lost city, Shedad son of Ad, built mid the Seba sands, a king who had dominion over many lands and kings, that city, built in pride and power, of things unstable of the earth, for he had read of paradise, and to himself had said, Now in this life the like of paradise, I'll build me and the prophets may despise. Having no need of that, he promises. So for this city taxed the lands and seas, and columned Irem on a blinding height, blazed in the desert like a chrysolite. The manner of its building, it is told, alternate bricks of silver and of gold. But Shadad with his women and his slaves, his thousand viziers, armoured troops, as waves of ocean countless, gored with awful flame, shot sheer in thunder on him, overcame, confounded, and abolished, ere his eyes had glimpsed bright follies of that paradise, and plotted to a wilderness the land, wherein accursed it lies and lost in sand, sad tales and glad, and mid them one in sooth, that is recorded of an Arab youth. The Khalif Hisham bin Abdul Malik, hunting one day through some unusual freak, rode, parted from his retinue, and gave chase to an antelope, without slave, vizier, or amir, to a pasture place of sheep he came, where dark in a tattered grace watched one an Arab youth, and as it came the antelope drew off, with words of flame on fire with rage, unto the youth he turned, shouting, Thou slave, ho, hast thou not discerned the antelope escapes me? Up dog, run, head him back this way. Rising in the sun, the Arab flamed, O oh, ignorant of worth, unworthy of respect, though high thy birth, in that thou lookest upon me, vile of heart, as one fit for contempt, thou lackest no part of my disdain. Allah, I would not own a dog of thine for friend, no other known. Poor though I be, thou tyrant mixed with ass, and flung him, rags and rage, into the grass. Incensed, astonished, frowning furiously, said Hisham, Slave, thou knowest me not, I see. Calmly the youth, I, verily, I know, O Manilus, who would command me so, except thyself? Eh, he said, peace to thee? Well, art thou known? I, all too well of me. O dog, I am thy caliph, by a hair thy life hangs ravelling. Though it dangled there and wrought to nothing, still upon thy head would curses shower. Of thy dwelling place would Allah be forgetful. Go thy ways, Hisham Bel Marwan, king of many words, few generosities. A flash of swords in drifts of dust and low, the caliph's troops around them rode. As when a merlin stoops some stranger quarry, prey that swims the wind, heron or eagle, kenning not its kind there, whence discast, until it, towering, feels an eagle's staring talons, and still deals blow upon blow, though hopeless. So the youth, an Arab, fearless as the face of truth, of all that made him certain of his death, waited with eyes indifferent, equal breath. The palace reached, Bring me the prisoner, commanded Hisham, and he came as were he in no wise concerned, with eyes intent on some far thing, and on the floor a bent dark gaze of scornful freedom unafraid, till at the caliph's throne his steps were stayed, and unsaluting, standing head held down, 
an armed attendant blazed him with a frown. Dog of a Bedouin, may thy eyes rot out. Insulter, art thou blind, and must I shout? Thou standest before the Sultan, bend thy knee. To him the Arab sneering. Verily, back saddle of an ass, it well may be. I kneel to none but God. The Caliph's rage exceeded now, and, By my realm and age, Arab, thy hour is come, thy very last. Then said, Call in the headsman. Fool, thou hast cast thy young life away, its thread is past. The shepherd answered, I, by Allah then, if through thy means it might be stretched again, unscissored of what destiny ordain, back in thy face I'd fling it as in vain. Then the chief chamberlain, O vilest one of all the Arabs, wilt thou not be done bandying thy baseness with the ruler of the faithful? Thou with wordy filth enough within thy madness mouth to fill a jakes, viler than dirt, than one from out it rakes, here's more for thee, and spat into his face. And the dark Arab, with that last disgrace, all fire answered, Thou perhaps hast heard the Quran text that says, Tis God's own word, the day will come, when each soul shall be prompt to bow before me, and to give a compt. Then wroth indeed was Hisham, fiercely said, He braves us, headsman, ho, his peevish head. See, canst thou medicine its speech anew? Doctor its multiplying words to few? Divorce them well. So where the Arabs stood, bound him, made kneel upon the cloth of blood, with curving sword the headsman leaned, at pause, and as this custom, made of Muslim laws, to the descendant of the Prophet quoth, O Caliph, shall I strike? By Iblis oath, strike, answered Hisham. But again the slave questioned, and yet again the Caliph gave his nodded yea, and for the third time then he asked, and knowing neither man nor jinn, might save him if the caliph spake assent, signalled the sword, the youth with body bent, laughed, till the wang teeth of each jaw appeared, laughed, as with scorn the king of kings he'd beard, deriding death. So with redoubled spleen roared Hisham rising. It is truly seen this one is mad who mocks at us rail. Then said the Arab, Listen, once befell, commander of the faithful, that a hawk, a hungry hawk, pounced on a sparrow cock, and winging nestward with his meal and claw, to him the sparrow, for the creature saw, the hawk's conceit, addressed this slyly. O oh, most great, most royal, there is not, I know aught in me that will stay thy stomach stress, I am too paltry for thy mightiness, with which the hawk was pleased, and flattered, so that in a while he let the sparrow go. Then smiled the caliph Hisham, and a sign staying the scimitar that hung malign, a threatening crescent, said, God bless, preserve the prophet, whom all true believers serve. Now by my kinship to the prophet, and had he at first but spake us thus, this hand had ne'er been wrathful, and instead of hate, he had had all except the caliphate, bade stuff his mouth with jewels and entreat him courteously, then from the palace beat. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Arabah by Madison Carwine Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone the third of these heroes the blind arabah gibbon and one brought pearls and one brought passion flowers to blind arabah as he lay in dreams and one brought visions of the after hours and he beheld the rainbow rolling streams of eden on harmonious sands of gold 
and battlements builded of prismatic beams he was not sightless now nor weak nor old for lo the dark-eyed girls of paradise rained on him gifts and kisses and is told how blind arabah rose with unsealed eyes with seeing eyes he who to allah gave all that he had which happened in this wise who's this that lies upon the moss called pave a blind man whom an angel's hand shall lead a beggar richer than the rich who have behold the lesson such as sufis feed the soul upon o faith blind praying see out of thyself how god repays indeed ten thousandfold one generosity all baghdad knew how at the hour of prayer a slave beneath each shoulder it was he old blind arabah whom a suppliant there footsore and hungry met and asked for bread alas my son god's poor are everywhere poor as a koreish priest arabah said richer than thou am i though poor indeed take thou my slaves and sell and buy thee bread thrust him his slaves and said great is thy need refuse and i renounce them and the wall struck with his staff saying this now shall lead while from the mosque rang the muezzin's call god is most mighty allah seeth all end of poem this recording is in the public domain the seven devils by madison cowain read for librivox dot org by sandra there is a legend lost in some old dusty tome of the east and who will question it concluding ancient wisdom rather musty wherein much war and wickedness and wit insult and wrath and love and shame are writ wherein is written that when mohammed fled out of mecca from the people's wrath he met a shadow standing in his path a naked horror blacker than hewn jet it in one hand held out a flaming jewel wherein fierce colours burnt and blent like eyes of seven fires merciless as cruel the horror said god curse them for their lies these are the seven devils of the wise and i am satan and the prophet saw how he might punish mecca for its pride and gazing on the fiend allah he cried let them be free his word like god's was law since then these seven devils have descended from nation unto nation past the can of mohammed who left earth undefended of any amulet of tongue or pen against demons boring at the brains of men demons whose names i dare not breathe or write for fear of fear despair and madness born of horror and of frenzy all forlorn and shadowy evils of the day and night End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Thomas by Madison Cowan. Read for LibriVox.org by Sandra. And it is said that Thomas sailed off islands of Aegean seas no seaman yet had ever hailed, no vessel touched, no ship of Greece, Phoenician, or the Chersonese and lying all becalmed tis told how wonderful with peace that night rolled out of dusk and dreamy gold one star whose splendour seemed to light the world with majesty and might like shadows on a shadow ship the dark-haired dark-eyed sailors lay when from the island seemed to slip borne overhead and far away a voice that samos seemed to say then silence and the languid greek the lounging cretan watched the sky 
or in carousal, ceased to speak and sing. Again came rolling by the voice, and Thamus in its cry. All were awake. Tall, swarthy men with bated breath stood listening, or gravely scanned the shore. And then, although they saw no living thing, again they heard the summons ring. And Thamus sounded shore and sea. And at the third call leaned the Greek full facing toward the isle, and he cried to the voice and bade it speak the mission, message it would seek. Thou shalt sail on to such a place among the pagan seas, it said, to such a land, and thou shalt face against it when the east is red, and cry aloud, Great Pan is dead. As fearful of unholy word, their souls stood stricken with strange fear. Then Thamos said, Yea, I have heard, yet tis my purpose still to steer straight on. That land shall never hear. And so they sailed that night, and came into an unknown sea. And there the east burned like a sword of flame, a cyclops forges. Straight the air fell sick with calm, the morn was fair. Then double dread was theirs, and dread was Thamus, and he raised his hand and shouted, Pan, great Pan is dead, and all the twilight haunted land cried, Pan is dead, from peak to strand. They saw pale shrines and temples nod among the shaken trees, and pale wild forms of goddess and of god crawl forth with crumbling limbs and trail woe, till the dim land grew one wail. What tripods groaned? Serapis first within Canopus temples heard the word, and his brute granite burst its monster bulk. Dodona stirred and bowed its oaks before the word that left them thunder-riven, then passed to Afaka, where, marble-hewn, Venus possessed a well that glassed her form, white burning like the moon, and, lo, her loveliness lay strewn. Then Orsilicia swept, and bent Sarpedon's oracle with scorn, Apollo. Yea, the gods lay rent, and Delphus dumb, and lo, the morn flamed o'er the world where Christ lay born. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Mameluk by Madison Cowain Read for LibriVox.org by Sandra 1. She was a queen. Midst mutes and slaves, a Mameluk, he loved her. Waves dashed not more hopelessly the paves of her high marble palace stair than lashed his love his heart's despair. As souls in hell dream paradise, he suffered, yet forgot it there beneath Romana's hoary eyes. 2. With passion eating at his heart, he served her beauty, but dared dart no look at her or word impart. Typhy leathers perfumed tan beneath her on a low divan, she lay mid cushions stuffed with down. A slave girl with an ostrich fan sat by her in a golden gown. 3. She bade him sing, fair lutenist. She loved his voice. With one white wrist hooped with the blaze of amethyst, she raised her ruby-crusted lute. Gold-welted stuff like some rich fruit. Her raiment, diamond-showered, rolled folds pigeon-purple whence one foot drooped in an anklet twist of gold. For he stood and sang with all the fire that boiled within his blood's desire, that made him all her slave, yet higher, and at the end his passions durst quench with one burning kiss its thirst. O oh, eunuchs, did her face show scorn, when through his heart your daggers burst? And dare you say he died forlorn? End of poem this recording is in the public domain. Romance of the Roses by Madison Cowan Read for LibriVox by Aaron K. Romance of the Roses A jongleur tells to the Viscountess of Ventador, wife of the seigneur of the Chateau de Ventador in Limousin, how the troubadour Bernard, her former lover, met his death. Time, the middle of the twelfth century. All the night was drowned in dreaming, 
and above the terraced height hung the moon a sinking crescent in the ocean mirrored white and a breath of distant music and a fragrance filled the night dripped the musk of myriad roses from a million heavy sprays and the nightingales were sobbing mid the roses where the haze and the purple mist of midnight caught the moonlight's rippled rays and the towers of the palace mid its belt of ancient trees on the mountain rose romantic white as foam of summer seas and the murmur of the ocean made a harp of every breeze where the moon shone on the terrace and its fountains falling foam where the marble urns of flowers spilled their perfume in the gloam by the alabaster venus stood her troubadour come home bernard he who was my master and your lover vantador there to meet her by commandment she the lovely eleanor she of normandy the duchess he is simple troubadour and she met him by the statue by the marble venus there like a moonbeam mid the roses who their crimson hearts laid bare breathing out their lives in fragrance at her naked feet and fair then she told him she was queen now that her husband now was king king of england and to-morrow she would sail and then a ring from her hand she took and gave him for the last time bade him sing and he sang below the dingles where the lazy vapors lulled where the torrent flashed its cascade touched with amethyst and gold echoed where the wild deer glimmered by the ruin gray and old from the venus then or roses struck a dagger snake that stung laid him dead who turned her heart-strings till for him alone they sung stilled the heart of him who only from her heart one note had rung and the nightingales kept singing mid the roses while like stone eleanor sank pale beside him and unto the palace lone stole a shadow with a dagger who shall sit upon a throne end of poem this recording is in the public domain the portrait by madison cowain read for LibriVox.org by sonia the portrait in some quaint nuremberg maler atelier up rummaged when and where was never clear nor yet how he obtained it when by whom twas painted who shall say itself a gloom resisting inquisition i opine it is a durer mark that touch this line are they deniable distinguished grace and the pure oval of the noble face tarnished in colour badly half in light extended so incline the exquisite expression leaps abruptly piercing scorn imperial beauty each an icy thorn of light disdainful eyes and well no use effaced and but beheld a sad abuse of patience often vaguely visible the portrait fills each feature making swell the heart with hope avoiding face and hair start out in living hues astonished there the woman lives your soul exults when lo you hold a blur an undetermined glow this limbs adorb restore ah i have tried our best restorers but it has defied storied mysterious say perhaps a ghost lives in the canvas hers some artist lost a duchess haply her he worshipped dared not tell he worshipped from his window stared of nuremberg one sunny morn when she passed paged to court her cold nobility loved lived for like a purpose seized and plied a feverish brush her face despaired and died the narrow Judengasse, gables frown around the hump-backed usurers where brown and dirty in a corner long it lay heaped in a pile of riff-raff such as say retables done in tempora and old panels by volgemut stiff paintings cold of martyrs and apostles names forgot 
Holbeins and Duors say, A haloed lot of praying saints, Madonnas, These, perchance, mid wine-stained purples, Mothed, an old romance, A crucifix and rosary, Inlaid arms, Saracen elaborate, A strayed niello of Byzantium, Rich work, in bronze of Florence, Here a delicate dirk, There holy patterns. So, my ancestor, the first de Heroncourt, esteemed by far this piece most precious, most desirable, purchased and brought to Paris. It looked well in the dark panelling above the old hearth of his room, the head's religious gold, the soft severity of the nun face, made of the room an apostolic place, revered and feared. Like some lived scene, I see that Gothic room, its Flemish tapestry, embossed within the marble hearth, a shield, wreathed round with thistles, in its argent field, three sable mallets, arms of Heroncourt, carved with the crest, a helm, and hands that bore, outstretched, two mallets, on a lectern laid, between two casements, lozenge, paint, embayed, a vellum volume of black-lettered text. Nearby a taper, blinking as if vexed with silken gusts, a nervous curtain sends, behind which haply daggered murder bends. And then I seem to see again the hall, the stairway leading to that room, then all the terror of that night of blood and crime passes before me. It is Catherine's time, the house, the Heroncourt's, on floors, splashed red, torchlight of Medici and wrath is shed. Down carven corridors and rooms, where couch and chairs lie shattered, and the shadows crouch, torch pierced with fear, a sound of swords draws near, the stir of searching steel. What find they here on St. Bartholomew's? A Huguenot, dead in his chair eyes violently shot with horror, fastened on a portrait there, coiling his neck one blood line, like a hair of finest fire. The portrait, like a fiend, looking exalted visitation, leaned from its black panel, in its eyes a hate demonic. Hair, a glowing auburn, late a dull, enduring golden. Just one thread, of the fierce hair around his throat, they said, twisting a burning ray, he staring dead. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Behram and Editma by Madison Cowine. Read for LibriVox.org. Against each prince now, she had held her own. An easy victor for the seven years, O kings and sons of kings. Iditma, she, who when much sought in marriage, Hating men, espoused their ways to win beyond their strength, Through martial exercise and hero deeds. She, who accomplished in all warlike arts, Had heralds cry through every kingdom known, Iditma weds with none but him, Who proves himself her master in the test of arms. Her suitor's foreman she, and he who fails, so overcome of woman, woman scorned, disarmed, dishonoured, yet shall he depart, brow bearing, forehead stigmatized with fire, the branded words, Iditma's freedman this. And many princes came to woo with arms, whom her high maiden prowess put to shame, pretentious courtiers, small and thu and thigh. Proud palanquined from principalities of Iraq and of Hind and further Sindh, though she was womanly as that empress of the proud Malachites, Tedmara, and more beautiful, yet she had held her own. To Behram of the territories, one son of a Persian monarch swaying kings, came brood of her and her great victories, her maiden beauty and her warrior strength. Eastward he journeyed from his father's court, with men and steeds and store of wealth and arms, to the rich city where her father reigned, its seven citadels set above the sea, like seven Afrits 
threatening all the world, and messengered the monarch with a gift of savage vessels rotten out of gold, of foreign fabrics stiff with gems and gold. Vizier ambassadored, the old king gave his answer to the suitor. I, my son, what grace have I beyond the grace of God? What power is mine but a material? What rule have I but a mere temporal? Me, than the shadow of the prophet's shade less. God invests with power but of man. Yea, and man's right is but the right of God. His the dominion of the secret soul, and his, her soul. Now hath my daughter sown by all her vestal soul, that none shall know her but her better in the listed field, determining spear and sword. Grant fate thy trust, she hangs her hand upon tomorrow's joust. Allah is great, my greeting and farewell. And so the lists of war and love arose, wherein Iditma with her suitor strove, mailed in Chorismian armour, hem and spur, on a great steed she came, Dravidian crest and hauberk, one fierce blaze of gems. The prince, harnessed in scaly gold Arabian, rode to meet her, on his arm a mighty shield of Syrian silver, high embossed with gold. So clanged the prologue of the battle. As closer it waxed, Prince Behram, who a while withheld his valour. In that she he loved opposed him and beset him, woman whom he had not scathed for the Khosrow's wealth. He held his folly, how he were undone with shining shame unless he strove withal. World fiery sword and smote the bassinet that helmed the haughty face that long had scorned the wide world's vanquished royalty, and so rushed on his own defeat. For like unto a cloud that caverned the bright moon all eve, that thunder splits and virgin triumph, there she sails a silver aspect. So the helm hurled from her head, unhusked her golden hair and glorious glowing face. By his own blow was Behram vanquished, all his wavering strength swerved from its purpose. With no final stroke stunned stood he and surrendered, stared and stared, all his strong life absorbed into her face, all the wild warrior arrowed by her eyes, tamed and obedient to her word and look. Then she on him, as eagle on a kite, plunged pitiless and beautiful and fierce, one trophy more to added victories. Healed off his mail, amazement dazing him, seized steed in arms, confusion filling him, and scoffed him forth, brow branded with his shame. Dazzled, six days he sat, a staring trance, but on the seventh, casting stupor off, rose, and the straightness of the case that held him as with manacles of knitted fire, considered and decided on a way. Once, when Iditma, with an oary band of high-born damsels under eunuch guard, in the walled palace pleasance took her ease, under a myrrh bush by a fountain side, where marble berries poured a diamond rain, in scooped cornelian, one a dim hoar head, a patriarch mid gardener underlings, bent spreading gems and priceless ornaments of jewelled amulets of hollow gold, sweet with imprisoned ambergris and musk, symbolic stones in sorcerous carcanets, gem talismans in cabalistic gold, whereon the princess marvelled and bade ask, What did the ancient with his riches here? Who questioned, mumbled in his bushy beard, to buy a wife withal, whereat they laughed as oafs when wisdom stumbles. Quoth a maid, with orient midnight in her starry eyes, and tropic music on her languid tongue, And what if I should wed with thee, O beard greyer than my great-grandfather, what then? One kiss, no more, and child, thou were divorced. He and the humour took them till, like birds that sing among the spice-trees and the palms, the garden peeled with maiden merriment, then quoth the princess, Thou wilt wed with him, Ansada, mirth in her gazelle-like eyes, and gravity sage solemn in her speech, and took Ansada's hand and laid it in the old man's staggering hand. And he unbent his crooked back, and on his staff arose, wrinkled and weighed with many heavy years, and kissed her, 
leaning on her shaking staff, and heaped her bosom with an amir's wealth, and left them laughing at his foolish beard. Now on the next day, as she took her ease, with a glad troop of girlhood, maidens who so many royal tulips seemed, behold, bowed with white ears, upon a flowery sword, the ancient with new jewellery and gems, wherefrom the sun coaxed wizard fires, and lit glimmers and glowing greens and pendant pearl, ultramarine and beaded, vivid rose. And so they stood and wondered, and one asked as yesternoon, Wherefore the father there displayed his shake locks and the genie gems? Another marriage? And another kiss? What, doth the tomb ripe court his youth again? O aged one, libertine in hope, not deed. O prodigal of wives as well as wealth, here stands thy damsel. Trilled the peritol diara with the midnight in her hair, two lemon blossoms blowing in her cheeks, and took the dotard's jewels with the kiss in merry mockery. Ere the morrow's dawn, we thought Iditma, shall my handmaidens, humouring a greybeard's whim, for wrinkled smiles and withered kisses, still divide his wealth, while I stand idle, lose the caravan whose least is notable? I too will wed, betide me what betides. And with the morn before the man, for privily she came, stood habited as were her tire maids in humble raiment. Now the ancient saw, and knew her for the princess that she was, and kindling gladness of the knowledge, made two sparkling forges of his deep-set eyes, beneath the ashes of his priestly brows. Not timidly she came, but coy approach became a maiden of Iditma's suit. She, gazing on the jewels he had spread, beneath the rose bower by the fountain said, the princess gave me leave, O grandfather. Here is my hand in marriage, here my lips. Adorn thy bride, then grant me my divorce. And humbly answered he, With all my heart, responsive to her quavering request. The daughter of the king did give thee leave, and thou wouldst wed? Then let us not delay. Thy hand, thy lips. So he arose and heaped her with barbaric jewellery and gems and took her hand, and from her lips the kiss. Then from his age, behold, the dotage fell, and from the man all palsied hoariness, victorious eyed and amorous, a youth, a god in ardent capabilities, resistless held her, and she, swooning saw, transfigured and triumphant, bending o'er, gloating, the branded brow of Prince Behram. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Torquemada by Madison Cowine. Read for LibriVox.org by Winifred Asman. To the chapter of the Archbishop of Toledo. What doth the Archbishop, his chapter of Toledo? Yea, doze they above some bull some dull, dry bull Pope Sextus sent to rot. Come, come, awake, O prelates militant, hear me, this is a truth I whisper now. Spain's king is less than king, as I am less than Paul the Apostle. Look you, look around, observe and dare, I write above my seal, a grave Dominican, to postulate, Pacheco, Marquis de Viena, croaks, no nonsense in your excellency's ears. King Henry's heir is illegitimate. Blanche of Navarre cast off. His impotence gave us a wanton out of Portugal for queen. Joanna, who bore him this heir, the cuckold king parades, a bastard now. Look, all the court laughs secretly, but masks are but for slaves. The people's smile is free from all concealment and the word still wags about this son, who is his favourites, Bertrand La Cueva's, handsome, exquisite, whom, people say, and what they say is true, the king himself, needing a lusty heir, made warm familiar with Joanna's bed. What shall we do? Endorse the infamy? Absolve them? Yea, absolve them at the stake. Or if not that, then with the axe that hews, the neck of state asunder. 
is it well prelates and ministers be merciful lest the disease of this delicious fruit this kingdom of castile corrode the core why not pare off all rottenness and leave the healthy pulp the throne the populace the church and god demand the overthrow deponement or the abnegation of this henry named the fourth the impotent alfonso lives it is my guarded hope that brothers of such kings have no long life am i impatient tis the tonsure then ambition ever was and i will be cousined to fierce impatience tis the cowl the tonsure and the cowl they must advance my native town valladolid did so the priestly germ ambition first in me rather twas planted there in me and had despite the richness of the soil poor growth and less encouragement the nipping wind of court disfavour was too much for it and so i bore it thence to cordova and sunned its torpor in a woman's smile neath which it sprouted but who trusts the sex grew to a tenderness too insecure for love's black frosts required hardiness and found it there at zaragoza where fat father lopez bluff dominican my youth confuted with wise nonsense and astonished spain in disputation in the public controversies of the monks transplanted to the court o oh, splendid speed sure hath its growth been now a cardinal's red is promised by the bud that tops its stem how have i through the saintly medium of the confessional impressed the ear of isabella daughter and dear child the incarnation of my dear ideal pure crucifix of my religious love sweet cross which my ambition guards and holds ploughed up the early meadows of her soul for fruitful increase in her maiden heart insinuated subtleties of seed shall ripen to a queen crowned with a crown from welded gold of aragon and castile how i this son of john the second named prince ferdinand of swarthy aragon grant absolution holy mother mine thus thy advancement and thy mastery would i obtain have on her fancy limbed in morning colours of proud chivalry till he a sceptred paladin of love and beaming manhood stands she dreams she dreams what heaven knows tis haply of a star she saw when but a babe and in the arms of some old nurse a star that laughed above a space of moorish balcony that hung above a water full of upset stars reflected glimmers of old palace fetes a star she reached for cried for claimed her own but never got that blue young promises court promises centupled from the tips of golden fingers at her infant eyes well when this girl is grown to be a queen what if one torquemada clothe her star in palpable approach and give it her when she is queen three steadfast purposes have grown their causes to divine results no young imagination did i train with such endeavour and for no reward how often have i told her of the things she could perform when queen while silently and pensively she sat and leaning heard absorbed upon my face her missile crushed by one propped elbow its bent careless leaves rich with illuminated capitals of gold and purple open on her lap long long we sat thus brothers speaking of felicity discoursing earnestly of earth and heaven and of who adhere to god's true vicar and our holy church beatitude and all the ceaseless bliss celestial of eternal paradise as everlasting as the souls that have built a strong tower for the only faith and i recall now how in exhortation filled with the fervour of my cause i cried walk not on ways that lead but to despair the easy ways of satan rather thorns for naked feet that will not falter if retentive of the arm of our true church 
who comforts weariness with promises, still urging onward and refreshes hearts with whisperings in the tuneless ear of care. And oft, big-eyed with innocence, she asked, Do some digress? And I, yea, many, yea, and there's necessity. We should annul, pluck forth the canker that contaminates, corrodes the milk-white beauty of our rose. God's persecution, they confront our faith with brows of stigmatizing error writ in hell's red handwriting. Shall such persist? No, heaven demands an end to all this shame. Her pledge she gave me then. When queen, for Spain the Inquisition, let the saints record. I promise thee, my father, thou shalt be a mattock of deracination to extirpate heresy. Well, well, time goes, the world moves onward, and I still am, oh, frere Torquemada, a Dominican. Blind Spain hastes blindly forward, eager for her hellward plunge. Our need is absolute. Conclusion to these monster heresies or their most imminent consequence. The throne which is derived directly from high God, meseems should champion God in any cause, and if it will not, we will make it to. Oh, Spain, Spain, Spain! Awake, arise, and crush these multiplying madnesses that mouth their paradoxes at the cross, and shriek their blasphemies in in the face of Christ. O miserable religion, is thy pride so fallen here? Thy tenement of strength so powerless? Then where's security, when steadfast principle is insecure, and God's own pillars rock and none resists? But I have tempered at a certain heat a heart of womanhood, and so have wrought the metal of a mind within the forge of holy discourse that Toledo's steel springs not more true than my reforming blade, which shall carve worship to a perfect whole, imperial Isabella, patroness, protectress of pure faith, sweet Catholic, our church's dear concern, its bell, its book, tribunal, and its godly act of faith. Hear how my soul cries out and speaks for thee. My lord and brothers, Hear me and perpend. This need is first to make her sceptred queen of wide Castile. To make the second need him whom Zymenes, my friend Cordelia, shall serve as minister, King Ferdinand, her wedded consort. And the third great need, the last which yet is first, to scour from Spain these moors who make a brimstone odious lair of that rich region of Granada which, like some vile sore of scaly leprosy, scabs Spain's fair face. Delay not, let the church divide attention then twixt heretics and unclean Jews. So wash her garments clean, King Henry falls. God and Saint Dominic aid our endeavor, and the Holy See build firm foundations. Let the cornerstone of our most holy inquisition here be mortared with the blood of heretics, that its strong structure may endure. And he, this Torquemada, the Dominican, made Grand Inquisitor and Cardinal. This monk who writes you now, whose spirit feels that God inspires him with his own desires, shall blaze God's name in blood upon the world. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. End the poems of Madison Cowine.